Hello, good afternoon, and welcome. I'm Chris Hawkins. Welcome to Circle Square and the Blue Dot in conversation in association with our friends at Brantwood. Today's guest is a celebrated women's rights activist and author. She's a, a special advisor on gender equality to the leading global aid organisation Care International and has served as a fellow at the London School of Economics, a visiting professor at Manchester Metropolitan and as Chancellor of the University of Suffolk. And she is, of course, the great granddaughter of Emily Pankhurst and granddaughter of Sylvia Pankhurst, leaders of the British suffragette movement. She's continued their legacy with a number of initiatives, including Olympic Suffragettes and GM for Women 2028. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Helen Pankhurst. Uh, if you've got any questions, then what we'd like to do is have you raise your hand as we go along. Rather than have questions at the end, if at any point you've got anything that you want to say, want to ask, then please do. Just stick your hand up and we'll pause and take that question, okay? Helen, what was it like growing up as a Pankhurst? <laughs> ah, um, I didn't know any other, any other option. That's how I uh, grew up, so it was very much definitional. I grew up in Ethiopia, so two influences. One was that country with all its wonder um, and poverty, so that combination of uh, the amazingness culturally, etc., of the country. Um, and then the other was this surname with its history of feminism and conflict and how you interpret and understand um, that, uh, that, that, uh, that war, really. Uh, what was the pressure of the name as, as a youngster once you were aware of who you were? Um, I was aware of it because, so I grew up in Ethiopia where the surname had this connotation of the link with Ethiopia because Sylvia, my grandmother, had campaigned for Ethiopian's independence. So in Ethiopia, people only knew about the surname linked to Ethiopian heritage and independence. And then I used to come to the UK during the summer and there adults would ask me the, uh, you know, what the, whether I was connected. So they'd pick up on the surname and they'd say, you know, are you related? And I would say yes. And then they'd smile and then they'd ask questions. So the pressure came a little bit from adults that would ask me questions. And then as I grew older, I felt that I needed to answer those questions. And then we moved to the UK and I got more and more of that. And the complexity and the richness of that heritage meant that I needed to be able to explain, for example, the schisms in the family um, and the differences between the suffragettes and the suffragists. So I think the pressure was more in needing to understand in order to answer questions and then needing to campaign as I grew up and realised that the issues that they campaigned for still remained as relevant today as they were over 100 years ago. How old were you when you moved back to the UK? 12. Okay. Um, in terms of your ancestry, were, were, were they unified? No, <laughs> not at all. Um, so um, let me ask you all a question. So the, the first names that you know of, give me a first name link to the Pankhursts. So interestingly, you all went for Emily. Any others? Christabel. Okay. What? Who else? Sylvia. Sylvia. There's one more. Ella. Yay. Okay. So four women, one mother, three daughters. You know, when in history have you got four key, key characters, four key women that people know about more than a hundred years ago? Um, and they, uh, the summary in terms of the disagreements between them, is that all four are buried in different continents. <laughs> um, you know, how far can you take your disagreements? But actually, there were two main schisms, and they're linked to party politics in a way. Um, Emmeline and Christabel on the one side, um, who became more and more conservative, um, Sylvia and Adela, who were more left-leaning. Um, but it was also because of tactics Emmeline and Christabel felt that at the time, working men didn't have the right to vote either. So practically, realistically, let's campaign and focus on middle class and 
upper class voices because they had the freedom to be able to engage. Sylvia Nadella felt that it was working class women who needed the vote more than others, so important to get their engagement and also issues around authoritarian versus democratic leadership. They disagreed on that. Um, so a lot more behind the schisms, a lot of differences of opinion. What, what about the men in the family? Families? Yeah, um, Richard Pankhurst, key figure in the whole lead up to the formation of the suffragette movement, but he died. He was a uh, radical. Um, he uh, had been the lawyer behind some of legislation such as the equal, uh, the Married Women's Property Act that gave uh, married women some legal rights at the time in order to change a situation where married women had very little uh, rights to retain their property. Uh, he died and ha having been an advocate of women's rights. And the, the, the linchpin, if you will, the catalyst to the formation of the suffragette movement just round the corner at the, um, well, in Manchester was that the ILP, the Independent Lady Party, um, decided to build a hall in honor of Richard Pankhurst because he, ha he was this very visible character in Man Manchester's history. So they, were, they wanted to build a hall in memory of uh, him. They asked Sylvia, my grandmother, the artist, to decorate the hall, and then in their wisdom decided that um, women wouldn't be allowed in the hall. And this is what formed the, this was the catalyst to the formation of the um, suffragette movement. So just to say they were influential um, in many ways. Um, uh, Emmeline also had two sons, but one died very young and the other died quite young, so don't really appear in the story. But were there male dissenters, though? No, not within the family. Around the family? Uh, probably. I haven't heard so much about them. I, I think, actually, you know, that, that point is really interesting and slightly going tangentially, but because it's making me think about it. In the film Suffragette, how many of you have seen the film Suffragette? Not enough? <laughs> Um, those of you who haven't, you can stream it. It's absolutely brilliant. I am obviously totally biased. Helen's in it. <laughs> <laughs> totally biased. Um, but if you, for those of you who've seen it, there are a number of male characters. And I think quite cleverly, they chart different positions from the, I'm totally in support of this radical movement and I will do anything to support through to, I'm totally against it. And then those whose uh, arc is of understanding, but not necessarily in parallel to their female counterparts. Um, so I think in all families, you will probably have everything from those who are very much in favor and those who are very much against. But in my own, I haven't heard so much about those who are against. Uh, tell me about the bond between Emmeline and Sylvia. Complicated. Um, so uh, I think the, the relationship between Emmeline and Christabel was the strongest. In any family, there are complicated dynamics and um, in the, so psychology would have a lot to say about all of this. Sylvia, as middle um, daughter, felt very close to her father, um, Christabel more to her mother. Um, her father died when Emmeline and Christabel were in France. Young Sylvia was left with her dying father and regretted not calling her mother um, to the, her father's dying bed early enough. So all sorts of things around that. And then the differences of opinion politically. Um, so they ended up on not on speaking terms and uh, my father was never, never met his grandmother. His grandmother, yeah. You haven't mentioned your mother yet. I haven't. Um, so uh, the relationships are my father was Sylvia's um, son. Mum um, uh, was uh, m uh, was brought into the Pankhurst dynasty um, to live in Ethiopia. So she um, very so I, I mean I don't even know where to start because she was incredibly courageous. So, uh, going back a bit, Sylvia went to live in Ethiopia at the age of I think seventy five. So in the nineteen fifties. Um, this 75 year old having possibly even older having done all of the other campaigning decides to go and live in Ethiopia uh, which was an incredible thing to end up doing and she went with my father and my mother joined them not married at the time and joined this family of radicals with Sylvia living in the family and so she 
um, took on a lot and um, became became very much part of that panka story. Has it ever been a burn? No. Um, the only time I've been a little bit worried about it is things like at the dentist chair, when I've worried that maybe somebody with a grudge might um, <laughs> have it in for me. But otherwise, no, it's been nothing but a joy. Uh, I can't imagine there are grudges, are there? <laughs> oh, I'm sure there are. Do you really believe that? I do. Um, I've had funny, funny um, engagements. So things like policemen have sometimes come to me with really lovely stories, actually. I remember uh, one, I was doing a demonstration in London and a policeman sidled up next to me and said, by the way, on behalf of all the policemen, just want to say sorry for the treatment that the suffragettes had. And I've also had somebody saying, uh, you know that photo of your grandmother being lifted up? And it's a very well-known photo, you might remember it, lifted up by a policeman. And next to him, there's a man in, who is a um, policeman in normal clothes. And the person who came up to me said, that was my grandfather. And just to know, he was always uncomfortable with the role that he played. So those are two stories of um, very, you know, positive stories. But um, I also remember ridicule. I remember people, whenever I spoke up, saying, oh, you're just like your grandmother or great-grandmother and that kind of thing. So uh, You used to be courageous. Do you think you're courageous? I haven't had to be half as courageous as they were. It's much easier for anybody in the UK now. I think about the women in Afghanistan and in other countries where they've had to put their life on the, on, on the line for the things that they um, hold dear. I haven't had to do that. So, n no. I'd, I'd love to be able to def define the, the impact of your family. But I can't find the words. Can you? Yes. Um, is where, where's my bag? Sorry, does anybody know where my bag is? Because in my book, um, yeah, uh, there's a definition of um, somebody, Noor, who's a young student here studying medicine at the moment. And she um, has this lovely quote about it giving her courage, that surname giving her courage. My bag is coming. Ta -da. <laughs> Thank you. Do feel free, of course. Thanks, say, thanks so much. Jump in at any point. There's anything you want to ask? Kelly. Yeah, please. Um, it's a well-worn version of the book. It is. It's just brilliant. I can find things very quickly, usually. Having said that, I probably won't now, but uh, where's Noor? Uh, here we go. The Pankhurst legacy means I'm not afraid to have ambitions, not stupid to dream, not deluded for wanting to transform the world in which we live. They taught me if they can make it possible, I can make it possible. Isn't that brilliant? I'll um, give you another quote. Yep. <laughs> uh, Emily said she wanted women to be lawmakers, not lawbreakers, a desire to be a rebel, not a slave. How do statements like that resonate with you now? So that one is very interesting because it's with the film in particular and the link to the states, it got interpreted in terms of issues around race. So slave, black, uh, rebel, white, um, uh, federal, uh, <coughs> confederal, uh, civil, losing my English here, but um, it got interpreted in terms of issues of colour. So um, I never use that quote because it gets misinterpreted. However, the statement around resistance rather than apathy, I think is as valid today as ever. And I think it's particularly important for those whose voices are traditionally silenced. So women who are conditioned to be well-behaved, who are conditioned to be quiet, receptive, for them to stand up and say no is just so hard. We're conditioned not to do that. So the need is massive to counter that. And what uh, Emmeline started speaks for, for those with, with, without a voice beyond just females. Absolutely. And it's so important that we look at that, the intersectionality of uh, inequality and vulnerability. It's not just gender by any means. Big question. What might it have been like had your great-grandmother not achieved so much? Uh, okay, so I think my answer to that is that change is a combination, I think, of three factors. Of the agency of individuals, of social norms change, and of policy or legal change. And I think that the legal or policy change, the right to vote, 
has happened in all countries and um, almost all countries. And there's an inevitability question mark about progress in that area. I say question mark because we do see some regression in some countries. I'm thinking of Afghanistan, for example. So generally, the history has seen laws, <coughs> laws that have encouraged and allowed more people to vote. <coughs> However, it's also about social norms change, and it's also about the agency of individuals. And I think what my great grandmother and what the suffragettes did was allowed women to dream and vision and think about a different future and create the norms and the culture of a different future. And that is as important as the law. It's not just about the law by any means. It's about those attitudes and those self-belief. And I think that they changed a whole generation of people. And amongst you all, if you think about your, your relatives, your grandmothers, your great grandmothers, they changed as a consequence of that movement and the, the questions that that movement generated. Do you know enough about her childhood, Emmeline's childhood, to understand her, her motivation at the start? Um, there's an autobiography and she talks about the fact that um, there's this one quote that her, she overheard her parents say something like, what a pity she wasn't born a boy because she was already quite strong minded and that didn't fit the ideas of what a girl should be saying or doing at the time. So she came from quite a radical family and yet even within that family, the assumption was that women should not be like boys, girls should not be like boys. What was her <coughs> education? Uh, quite minimal, I think, no, nothing very formal. And even um, uh, Sylvia, the next generation were only, and again, that was the, that was, th those were the times. But Sylvia and co have had very little uh, education. They had a bit at the Manchester um, School for Girls. I'd like to find out a bit more about you, Helen, and, and, uh, and to start, Ethiopia. Um, where in Ethiopia and what kind of lifestyle did you have? So I grew up in Addis Ababa in the capital and my parents were very uh, engaged in the Ethiopian urban intellectual elite, I suppose is what you'd call them. Um, but we were, um, for example, I learned Amharic, I learned the Ethiopian language as a child. We went to the French school, that was my mother's influence who thought that um, that would be better and also it was closer. Um, so we, we went to French school and we were some of the few, in fact, I think the only family that were non-Ethiopian that took the Amharic classes because my parents felt strongly that we needed to belong and identify and learn the language. And I'm forever grateful for that because it meant I had that perspective, a closer understanding of the country than I would have otherwise. I wonder how grateful you were at the time. I wasn't. <laughs> Others went off and had a free time and I didn't. Also, the pedagogy, if that's the right word, of the Amharic classes were very different. So I remember physical punishment happening in the Amharic classes and they didn't happen in the French classes. It was purely, you had to put your hand out and you were hit with a stick, but it was more than we had in the other classes. Um, did, did <laughs> a question, do, do you think, at the age of, what, say, nine, ten, did you wonder why you were there? Um, no, I think it, I, I kind of assumed that that was right. It, yeah, I think if you, if you grow up in a different culture, you're always possibly slightly not quite um, belonging, but still that's all you know. So I felt the reverse here because when, when we moved here, I didn't know a lot of the idioms and, you know, I, I grew up in warmer, Climb, so I felt very uncomfortable in the cold here and so on. So I think I've always felt a little bit of the other, but that's also meant that I've always been interested in global issues and the local to the global has been important to me. And when did you come <coughs> back to age 12? London. And where in London? Um, uh, my grandfather lived in Swiss Cottage and we went to the French school in, in South Kent. And um, do, you, do you think you had anywhere near a normal teenage time? It, it, the French school only really allows you to study. There's very little time for other things. There's very ex little extracurricular activities. I then went to an international school, and so that became part of my um, upbringing, which was also not very usual. Do you think that the name, the life that you've described, do you think it prohibited you from enjoying a, a normal teenage life, something that perhaps you look back on now and wish you'd had? Hmm... 
don't know. I don't think so. I, I don't wish for a different childhood. I, I got so much out of the one I, I had. And it's defined me. I'm, I'm really, the, the internationalism and the feminism are everything that's continued to be important to who I am. When did you leave home? When did I leave home? Um, to go to a international school in Wales at the age of 16. And then what? And then it went on, um, University, um, Sussex, and then Edinburgh. Um, in the States. Your international work. Are you really interested in all of this, the rest of you? I think it's really important to understand your life okay. um, in context. Um, your, your international work, so many projects. I'm going to go through at least two or three of them. Um, the Centenary Action Group first. Tell, tell us about that. So that was set up uh, around 2018 um, with this idea that 1918 was when some women got the vote. It was the first act. And then uh, 1928 was equal franchise when men and women got the vote um, on equal terms. And I felt that um, between 2018 and 2028, that was on our watch. So what could we do? So um, together with a group of people, we set up the Centenary Action Group with the idea of looking at what the barriers were to women in political spaces and trying to campaign to address those. So um, it's looking at, in particular, three sets of barriers. One is violence against women in politics, which is just so obvious a constraint. Um, the other is around the structures of parliament and the political systems. And the third is around the economic constraints. So we're a cross-party uh, coalition that campaigns to try and address those barriers. How do you feel about recent events in parliament? Depressed. <laughs> <laughs> I just think they're so, I mean, what 27% of the cabinet, I think even less actually, 26% of the cabinet are women, 34% uh, of um, uh, parliament, 28% of the House of Lords, we still have 96 hereditary peers that are men. And then the, I haven't I even touched on the culture and all of the issues around um, misogyny and all of that. Uh, incidents in recent weeks must hurt. Yeah, I mean, does anybody have that much faith in what's going on in Westminster anymore? And, and you know, the, our democracy is so much the weaker for it. It's, and yet it's so important. Yes, questions. So depressed. So I don't know whether everybody heard, but that's about the policing bill. And there was a lot of resistance to some of the worst of it. And, um, you know, thank goodness, thank goodness for the House of Lords that actually kind of reduced some of the negative aspects of that bill. But it just means that so much of what any, any campaigners have done in the past is limited now by that bill. So yes, a lot of it is regress regressive. And I think that assumption that we're just going forward no. Uh, how uh, effective would you say protest is in 2022? Not, not successful enough, not effective enough, and yet you have to hold on to hope and to, you have to do what you can. Um, also, I think you never know when you're going to get the gains. I think you can push and push and push and you never know and there are certain changes. And we've seen this on some, some laws. We've been behind the ILO Convention 190, which is harassment at work, um, which followed on and was, is linked a little bit to the Me Too campaign. Um, and it is leading to massive legislative changes in many countries to ensure that um, violence at work is being addressed much more systematically. Um, or even things like um, the equal pay, uh, some of the legislation around reporting on uh, pay gaps, that's leading to certain changes. So I think you have to hold on to where you can achieve change and just keep going. How do you go about lobbying? Um, different ways, but the most interesting thing I think about the suffragettes is not their militancy, it's their lateral thinking. They were just phenomenal at their clever PR stunts. So I think humour and clever stunts go a lot further than anger or sometimes noise, actually. Is there a good example that you can think of? Um, uh, not, uh, not so much in my own, this magical bag. Um, <laughs> not so much in my own case, but, um, or maybe I can think of ones, but uh, this is a old one penny. And um, the suffragettes used to stamp votes for women on the image of the king. So you're 
defacing the king, which is just the worst thing possible, but you're passing on your message. So anybody that gets the money gets the message. So really clever stuff. Um, and then this, you'll know from the film, but it's the uh, badge and it's kind of, it's a military symbol, but it means that uh, you, sh you show the power of your resistance and each time you were imprisoned, you got another of those bars. Um, We've used dressing up as suffragettes as the way of linking past and present to make the points. Um, is that always with you, that bird? <laughs> no, not always. <laughs> it's a handy prop. <laughs> it is. Um, when you're protesting, do, do you think you channel your, your grandparents, Sylvia and me? Um, I have the power of that surname that gives me, it's a cloak of support. But more importantly, I think I'm that much more visible as a consequence. The media are that much more interested. People are that much more interested. So it's, it magnifies the message in ways that are really powerful. So I'm, I'm very glad. Uh, tell us about the Greater Manchester GM for Women 2028 group. Great. Well, thank you. That, thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> it is a bit of a, yeah, GM for Women is the summary. Um, any of you in Manchester that are interested in making a difference within Greater Manchester, this initiative, again, 2018 to 2028, and the idea is to look at the data around what's happening in Greater Manchester for women and girls and to push for change. So if any of you are interested in engaging, we are um, a small group, um, quite a few linked to the different universities around Manchester or um, in companies or civil society, just trying to look at what's going on and make a difference. So please stay behind if you want to join. Um, we're always looking for recruits. And if you look at the website, GM for Women, you'll see what we're doing. So for example, we have an event on the 2nd of July where we're trying to create space for those with power on a particular issue to be in a conversation with those who are complaining or have an issue to make. Um, as an example, at an event that we had where we looked at the data. So we have these 10 indicators that we're tracing over the 10 years um, and the data is going back, is going down, not better. And in the conversation around that, one of the issues that came up was around girls and football. And I don't know whether you've seen this, but a lot of girls are now playing football, youngsters, and they're playing, but then they stop playing and they stop playing because the clubs no longer support them. The boys start teasing them. The facilities are not there. And so we wanted to address this issue that change was beginning and then being thwarted. So where there's this, we're going to have, that's one of the themes that's going to be discussed. How do you explain that? That all of these structures and systems are still very resistant to change. And you think you've changed something and you haven't. You've created a moment, but everything else then kind of stops it from happening. One of the imageries that, uh, in the book that somebody used was an elastic band. You're pulling the elastic band and you think you've achieved change and you let go because you think you've got there. And when you let go, it defaults back. And in fact, it defaults back worse. You'd be very proud of my 12 year old who joined her new secondary school and was appointed to the school council. And she only made one change and that was to introduce girls football to the school for the first time. Very good. Well, and, well, and watch that, playing. exactly, watch that but space, now, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, the Pankhurst Centre is close to your home for very obvious reasons. Uh, tell us about that place. Okay, how many of you seen, have been in the Pankhurst Centre? Okay, again, brilliant, but not enough. Those of you who have not been, I don't know whether you live in Manchester, but I assume many of you do. It's just around the corner, and it's the place that the suffragettes started the campaign. So it's both the home, the, the personal home and the political home of the suffragette movement. And there is this parlour, which is where it all happens. And there's a very lovely small display that tells the story. More importantly, it's also an active centre. So it is where the Manchester Women's Aid is based and a number of other. There's a um, food bank there. So it's an active women's rights space as well as a history of the story of the suffragette movement. And I love the fact that it does both. It does the history, the memory, um, the holding on to the traditions of what it was all about. And yet it's also an active center for women's rights right now. Right here in Manchester. Right here. The birthplace of the suffragette movement. Yeah. Amazing. Um, the film, I guess you were a consultant. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and you did, uh, I mentioned that you were in it. Yeah. You, you were, weren't you? Yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah. And, and your daughter too. Yeah, she, in fact, I was telling you earlier, she has, I, I'm just there kind of filing things and she's there and picks up a phone and actually has one word, which is, hello? Um, how important was that film? Really important. Um, I, I think it reached, films can reach so many uh, people that, you know, history might not reach. It, it, it follows through over time so people can still watch it now. It's a very short, succinct entry into the world of the suffragettes. It's the main characters are composite. So in one hour and a half or whatever it is, you can tell such a complicated story of so many um, different people. It's immersive. Um, it's complicated. Uh, it shows the political arc and the complexity of it. And yet also it doesn't do it justice because, for example, for those of you who've seen it, there is one force feeding scene. There is one scene of something where actually the worst thing about the force feeding was that the women who were sitting in their cells would hear the force feeding of their companions before they got to them. Then they would be force fed and then they hear the force feeding of the others. And this didn't just happen once. It happened three times a day. It happened day after day after day. And the crime being? And the crime being they wanted the right to vote. And this is a liberal democratic government that did it. I mean, yeah. The film did uh, really well, didn't it? Uh, reassuringly well. Yeah, yeah, and, and please, please do watch it. Um, my main, again, I was telling you, my main contribution to the film was actually the get, getting the dates at the end where you um, see when women got the vote in different countries. And I thought that was so important because it universalised the story. Uh, explain what you mean. Then. So at the very end, you get, uh, um, you get the dates of when women got the vote in different countries. So it starts with, you know, 1918, some women got the vote, 1928, uh, all women got the vote. It's also got the figure of when women got the rights to um, terms of child, uh, looking after their children and so on. But the main one is it gives you the different dates around the world. And... That means that you've just watched the film and then you see the scrolling of these dates. And I think you realise that that fight for women to have the right to vote is universal and it's still happening because the last date is, I think it was 2015. When the film came out, the last date on there was, I think, 2015. So, yeah. Yeah, and Saudi, Saudi Arabia, Arabia yeah. right at the, at the end. OK, um, by way of now bringing all that we've talked about up to date um, and with reference to your book, To Deeds Not Words, how are we doing now? So not good enough. And I, that was the main, the, pro, the reason for writing it was I kept on being asked, you know, what would they have said? And I wanted to look at that and to, to think about that. So I'd be very interested in your thoughts about this. So what I do in the book is by chapter, I consider whether, whether they were there yet, whether anything has changed. And um, to, to get your perspective on this, um, should we do it by chapter? Yeah. OK, so the first chapter is on politics. What do you think? Zero, no change. Five, equality. In the UK, where are we? Are we one, two, three, four? Can you all put your hands up with whatever you think we're at? So zero would be no change. Five would be the way there. What am I seeing? Twos, threes? Three, sorry? Base? base is 19, is um, 100, over 100 years ago, so um, yeah. 1918, let's say. Um, threes, twos, threes, fours. Okay, so I'd probably say three as the average. Um, if we had time, we'd be interested to get your views on that. Not sure, do we? I, I think so. I, I okay. mean, are you surprised at a four, for example? I'm very sure surprised by the fours. So could we maybe hear from those who are going forward to their thoughts on that? It's a, a safe space. Um, anyone willing to to explain their score? Thank you. Yeah, always. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, from having no vote to the position that um, is in now, I mean, I'm really pleased that that is a fairly strong performance on a on a mark of one to five. You know, I'm, I'm not suggesting that John's over. I mean, I've you know been involved on the periphery, you know, sort of all my adult life, but I mean. Actually, there's massive progress made, especially looking at that, maybe not in the right time, most of the people here. I mean, it has obviously plateaued and stagnated, but I think if you go back to, you know, pre-1980, then, yeah, I'll give it a four. 
Okay, those who scored it a two, in contrast, let's just hear, yeah? I think if you're looking at voting on its own, maybe you could give it a four, but I think politics in general in terms of accessibility, who's in parliament, and all that sort of stuff, that's why I'm giving it a two. Okay, other views, other fours, or other, yeah? I put a three, I mean, now, isn't there like a thing that now you need an ID to vote? And that's like, there's a lot of people in poverty, there's a lot of people who can't get access to have an ID or some sort of document. And, you know, we just think, oh yeah, anyone has access to it, but it's not. And, and that just happens. It, it, yeah, it's a lot of times as well, those who are staying at home, even in 2022, it's women, mostly. So. Other views? What about your view, Helen? <laughs> I can't even remember what I, what I scored it, but I know that between the, um, pay, the hardback and the paperback, I changed my opinions on some of the um, scores on the basis of what I was hearing as I was doing talks up and down the country. Um, uh, so right now, I'd probably score it less than I did before because of the issue around the culture and actually some of the figures have gone down. And my guess is that the next election, they might go down again. So for example, the number of women in uh, cabinet have gone down, has gone down recently. Um, and um, yeah, certain underlying issues. I'd probably score it a two and a half. If I was allowed halves, I think I allowed myself halves, I'd probably score it a two and a half. And I think I probably scored it a three last time. Uh, Shall we move on? I mean, what about economically? What, can can, can yeah. I uh, first, uh, do you have access to political leaders? Do they come to you? Do you go to them and, and uh, make your case? Um, yes, uh, up to a point. Um, at, with the Centene Reaction Group, I, uh, a fair amount of en engagement with um, MPs and peers, uh, some of whom are involved in the Centene Reaction Group itself. And then um, with a GM for Women, we, you know, we're, we're linked to the uh, GMCA and to some of the councillors and some of the MPs and to Andy Burnham. So, so you know, certain linkages. Um, Do they want to listen? They usually want to talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I, I just think this, I mean, I take your point that there is progress in terms of voting. I just think that it's too slow. It's just too slow. And it's not a straight line. And I, I think anybody who was campaigning and being force fed would, you know, for that right would be saying, come on, we can do better. And that's the point. We can do better. We must do better. Um, what about economically? Though so again, same question, if we can yes. move on. So zero, no change. Five, equality. How do you feel we are in terms of the economics of the difference between uh, men and women here in the UK? What are, what are you thinking? One, two, three, four, five, where are we? Twos, threes, 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 twos. Um, yeah. With, without wishing to, to steer the scores, um, because the scores are now in. Um, you, you said in the book, uh, poverty still wears a female face. This was only three or four years ago. Yeah. Is that still what you believe? Yeah, and look at what the pandemic did from that perspective. Um, you know, the if you look at figures around uh, those who lost their jobs, if you look about the figures that those who gave up their jobs because of domestic responsibilities around um, uh, working from home and uh, kids being at home and so on. If you look at um, the pay insecurities, um, the, the, the gig economy and all of that, the, there is a feminization of poverty that's going on, which is increasing. And it's, it's a global feminization of poverty. So I, I do think that we're not necessarily getting better in all of that. If you look at the valuation of work, and it, it links to beyond work, it links to the link, it link between work and home. Those issues are still very problematic. We're, we're still separating work and home in a way where you don't value and don't understand how home impinges on work and therefore um, what the economic monetary um, value of work is. How, how does the role of a, a woman as a, a mother fit, fit in with what you just So. The, I think the main point is that we define women as mothers and as the relationships to their family, and we defend, define men as autonomous. And we can't do that. That's just not the reality of the world in which we live. That has to be transformed. We have to define men as also fathers. 
as partners. And yet we don't. I mean, in any conversation you don't. Bring two women together, they will talk about their families. Bring two men together, they will talk about their work. I'm exaggerating. How was it in your household with two kids? Um, I think we tried to do things differently and often reverted back to the tradition. And I've heard this a lot from a lot of feminists that say it's easier to be feminists outside the home than it is at home. You know, you, you, we get that even from politicians, so that there's a, there's a reverse, reversal sometimes to gender norms at home. Is that then a change that can't be made? No, it's just a change that takes time and persistence. What's it like in your family? Oh, yeah. <laughs> My wife's not here. Um, it's a good question. Um, we're, we're both working parents, uh, and I think my daughter definitely prefers her mum. Um, so the, the role of, of, my, of my wife as, as a parent, I would say, I would say we're pretty equal, but we, we only have one child, and I think that makes life easier. I think. And my wife is a real feminist. So maybe we're not a normal household. Mm. A normal household. What about the rest of you? How do you feel about this issue of how society still defines men, women? Um, <laughs> I think we, in this generation, try and revert a lot of the things of the generation subjects that that past, which could potentially like you know, for arguments or debate. And I think a lot of the time you just have to keep trying and trying and trying to like make the change. Like my partner's mum like turned around to me once and she was like, I'm really sorry, I thought I was just doing the best for my son and now like we're trying to fix all these things. And we're getting there. But I think that's why feminism's a, a, a man's issue, right? Because I'm with someone who's receptive and understands these issues and we've, we've got an equal partnership. But I think giving women the, not the power, but also men the understanding of why it's important. I get that, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think I, I live in a, a household with two strong women and there's just me and a small dog. And I am happy to be downtrodden. Uh, we need to get back to the, uh, the scores for economics. So um, we had, I think, around three as an average. I, I think I would probably score that, again, going backwards rather than forwards. Um, the, and then we also touched on the issue of identity. So that was the how women are seen at home and issues around health and um, one of the and also social media that one of the things I found when talking to a lot of people is this concern that social media was um, focusing more and more on what women look like. So what men say and do and what women look like. And we've had that throughout history, the books that we read, the films that we watch, the TV, everything, the narratives, always, it's what women look like. I mean, it's just so dominant. How can that still be the case? So the, I was hearing from things like teachers saying that in secondary school, the first thing that happens is that girls show their photos and the boys rank how hot the girls are in their class. And this happens in the first week of secondary school. An uh, eight-year-old girl who was in tears when her father went up to talk to her because she didn't have dark enough tights and she was worried that her hair shows. So image, culture, the social media, these phones of ours have made that problem worse. Do girls not do that with boys? No, they didn't in this case. I mean, there's a bit of it, but not to the same extreme. Again, what are your experiences? Yeah. So single sex schools, I'm conflicted. I would prefer um, uh, not to send, I didn't send my um, kids to single sex schools because I, to, yeah, because I felt that the real world is mixed and it's better to be engaged in the real world. But I understand those parents in particular with girls who feel that um, it's a safer space for them. Um, because- That scenario wouldn't necessarily happen. Apart from social media now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do, do you think we've got to the heart uh, of the matter, if you like, in that education is so key and failing? So I think education is key. I think the things around education in the space of schools are key. So the uniforms, the uniforms are not 
gendered. We were just talking actually uh, at another uh, event I, I was at about the, the shoes that the girls and the boys are given in schools are very different, still quite different. Um, the, the skirts, um, the, yeah, so the, basically the whole thing around the, sc the schools, the, the uniforms, the what sports they are allowed to do, the, um, the language, the books that they're reading, the, um, the whole attitudes, let alone what they're studying. So the, the whole structure within which schools operate are still problematic. But a lot of it starts in nursery schools as well. So, you know, where, where do you tackle these things? Have we sorted economics? Yeah. <laughs> Did we ever actually get a conclusion? Uh, um, I think we got a conclusion that we're not there yet. Okay. There's a question up down there. I work in a hospice and we do talks in schools and my colleague's 29 and she said we're going to have two mascots, one girl and one boy. And I managed to say one of them maybe shouldn't be white because all of our imagery is white. The community we're working is predominantly white, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to reflect what we want, which is diversity. And she said, um, so we need some personalities. So the girl is going to be loving, kind and caring. And the boy is going to be funny, confident and something else. And the girl is, I'm not kidding, knitting, baking, and the boy likes gardening. So I managed to get the girl to like golf because they wanted to include <laughs> golf as the, for the boy. And I just, I, I thought I do live in a bubble. Like, why is feminism not reached? Like, because that messaging is, even though the school might be doing a great job, they've trusted us with that 15 minutes. And, you know, the girl, obviously, she had a ponytail and she's wearing more, like, purple, which obviously purple's a great colour, but the boy is wearing, like, bolder colours. Um, so, yeah, it's, it is a bit, like, um, good to be in spaces where you can make a little difference, where you wouldn't expect. Like, I wasn't expecting to have that opportunity, but... Small changes, and they're needed everywhere. Yeah. Uh, next subject, autonomy. Yeah, um, I think, and that links to the conversation we were having a little bit about um, the sense that women are seen as relational and men are seen as autonomous in terms of their work. Um, is that what you were meaning? In, in 2018, that, that got a score of four out of five in the book. Yeah, it wouldn't get it now. What, what does it get in the room this afternoon? Yeah, so, so this was that issue around how women are defined versus how men are defined, that men, I think, are defined to be more autonomous. And, and the dangers of that, the danger of men not having the language, the emotional language to talk about their relationships, whereas women being encouraged to have that language and to, be, to see themselves as relational. Um, and, and the issue around the, the image uh, of, of women being so important. So all of that I was putting under that category. What do people feel? Are we, is, uh, yeah, what, are, what are our scores around that? It's twos, it's a slightly difficult one to threes, twos, threes. So we're not there yet as a summary to that one. Uh, violence against women you deal with in the book. Yeah, I almost feel like let's skip that one altogether because yeah. I mean, it, that's so depressing. We could talk, just so, that not, so as not to get too depressed, we could talk about culture, because I think things are shifting there. I, I want to ask first, who is to blame? We all to blame. Right, explain. It's back to the culture issue, isn't it? I think if we, if we all don't try and change things in our own spaces, if we all assume it's somebody else's responsibility, then, you know, it, 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 small things, Cresta Dick, was it her responsibility to... To, change, to, to look after the, what the police were doing or to look at the relationship between the police and citizens. She felt that it was one of those, not both. And that's, that was her un, undoing, is that she felt her role was to support the police, not to understand the relationship between police and citizens. Were you pleased to see her go? Uh, always sad to see somebody who was effective and the first woman in her leadership position to go really sad but I think it was probably the right call because I think of a misreading of the importance of that role so and it's back to that point about I think we all have a responsibility to to do what we can to address these types of issues and not just to look at our role as managers as um, whatever other roles we have to understand that we have this role 
in terms of our relationship with each other. Can you foresee a female prime minister in coming years? Uh, we've had two, um, so we will have more, um, but it's not the solution. It's more women in all positions that's important. Uh, yeah, you preempted my next question, which was going to be, if we did, would that be a significant change? Not enough. And again, it's the issue of where change comes. Change comes in the schools, in the nursery, um, nurseries, in, the, um, in, in our relationships with our kids, with our sons, how we bring sons up, and in Parliament, and I think getting rid of those 96 hereditary male peers, um, even although the House of Lords has been wonderful in so many ways. So it, it, everywhere for me is change is needed. Why have you never gone directly into politics? Because I'm not a party political animal and you have to be a party political animal. Could you not be one? <laughs> no, <laughs> because I believe in cross-party work and, and that's where I think my voice is more powerful. I, I assume it's, it's been mooted. It has, yes. But it's a definite no. It's a no at the moment. It's a no at the moment. <laughs> that was a political answer if I remember what it was. <laughs> you're in. Um, it seems like so much of what you're saying that, that, that is concerning it is that changes have been made but, but we've gone back. Yeah. Well, I, I'm finding it hard to understand why that, that can be. I think I'm also looking at that from the global perspective. And again, what's happening in the States, what's coming, happening in Afghanistan comes to mind and other countries where uh, Ethiopia, I've seen some wonderful progress one minute and then things going backwards in others. So again, it's that point that we have a responsibility to keep chipping away because if we assume that somebody else has done it or somebody else will do it, then it's, it's, things will go backwards. I think it is, to my mind, fair to say, 1918 to now is a, a, a big change. Uh, but you mentioned Saudi Arabia. Uh, until the Middle East makes big changes, then the, the rest of the globe is waiting, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, we are interconnected and look at environmental issues as well. You know, we can't, have, we, 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 we don't exist in islands independent of the context, both environmentally and socially, politically, etc. Politically as well. I mean, there, there are trends and influences that cut across from one country to another. Uh, coming full circle, um, and, and back to Emmeline, where did we start? Uh, not too sure. A bit more, tell me a bit more. <laughs> I mean, back to 1918, I suppose. And I mean, in a in, in hundred years from before the changes that she made happen, where were we then, do you think? How, how would you put into words where, where we were? Um, so given what I've just said about the complexity of some of this, I also think maybe with our eyes now, we tend to assume that everything was a lot worse and only a lot worse. Um, over 100 years ago and well before Emmeline was campaigning. And I think that that's probably wrong. I think there were, there's much more nuance in what the past was like and even what the present is now. So as we were voting, we are talking about being in Manchester with a certain class and a certain set of people with those views. If you talk, you know, to, if, if this was happening in another part of Manchester with another set of people, they would be scoring very differently. Um, certain generations, genders would be scoring differently. So I think what I'm saying is our experiences are moulded by those that we are around, that those around us, and it's and, and holding on to the complexity and understanding that is as important as thinking about the trends. Where are we heading? With all of our work, somewhere better, I hope, with all of our responsibilities and all of our engagements, but let's not take that for granted. What's key to change? not giving up, persistence, um, a sense of common purpose. You know, the UK is at its best when it brings that out. The world is at its best when it works together. We've seen moments of that collective engagement. I just need more of it. Has it been a privilege being born into the Pankhurst family? Most definitely it has. Thank you so much. You're an incredible, incredible woman. Um, not surprisingly, so thank you so much for being so honest and, and for sharing incredible insight and your stories. It's been fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much. Helen Pankhurst.
Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for, I'm afraid. But uh, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. We're thrilled to have had Helen join us this afternoon. And we look forward to welcoming her to Blue Dot this July at Jodrell Bank with a, a programme of talks which we'll be announcing very soon. You'll be able to find out more on Blue Dot's social media channels and at discovertheblue.com for now from Blue Dot and Bruntwood. Please join me in saying once again, a huge thank you to Helen for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you.